Hi, everybody, and welcome to Online Teaching Tuesdays number four. Uh, we are joining you. My name is Bonnie Stewart, and I am in Windsor, Ontario. And uh, Dave, you can introduce yourself, and I'll start the uh, slides. Hi, I'm Dave Cormier. I'm at the University of Windsor as well. I'm in uh, exactly the same room as Bonnie. Except you're not. <laughs> Michael? Hey there, Michael Barber. I'm at Toro University, California in Vallejo. Laura, go ahead. Oh, um, my name's Laura, and I live in North Carolina, but I teach for the University of Oklahoma. And you are joining us for OTT 20, which is not actually hot 20, even though um, I realize that my hashtag does make it look a little bit that way, but we're taking all the fake compliments, so there we are. Um, it is great to have everybody here this week. Uh, just kind of a reminder, I know that everybody in um, navigating the current shift to online learning is doing so in different contexts, and you have probably different institutional policies and tools available to you. We're not here so much to talk about what tools do I use to teach online, but very much about how do we do this from a pedagogical perspective and how do we create meaningful experiences. Um, I saw this the other day and I don't want to critique um, education in the sense that I'm not a big fan of the education is broken narrative, but there have always been ways in which education is actually has a great many inequities underneath it. And one of the things that moving online does is it makes all of those inequities more visible. And so one of the things we'll talk about today is pedagogies of care for kind of navigating some of these inequities. Um, quickly, our theme is simple, equitable, and engaging as a framework for online teaching. And there are three wonderful webinars, free and available to you um, on k12olaya.ca, online learning in a hurry. If you have any interest in going back and checking those out, they are there for you, or feel free to share them with your decision makers, your colleagues, whomever. But this week, um, we have actually three guests joining us, but one got called into a meeting that she couldn't get out of, so hopefully she'll be with us before too long. But Laura is here, so Laura, you take it away and introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll move on to Michael. Well, like it says there on the slide, I teach uh, online. I've taught online for a long time, so already online before the pandemic, and I teach courses in mythology and folklore at the University of Oklahoma. And my special interest is stories and storytelling. And so I've listed some links there on the slide. Um, I've got a home base with a lot of materials. You can see uh, Open Canvas course. The work my students do, they all blog. And if anybody has questions about the power of blogging, I'm glad to try to answer them. And Laura's, you can see that her actual Twitter handle is online course lady. So she's been doing this for a while. Um, Michael, you go ahead and I'm gonna mute myself because that was my doorbell, pardon me. Hi there, I'm Michael Barber. I'm an associate professor at Torah University. Um, I've been involved in this now for I guess about 23 years when I first got um, as a high school teacher in Bonavista, Newfoundland. And um, since that time, I've done just about everything that you could do within the K-12 online learning environment. But I guess I'm best known as a researcher because that's what I've spent the, the longest at. And um, you can check out all of my different social network handles and all of my scholarship uh, at my website at the bottom there and I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys and, and uh, answering any questions and hopefully brainstorming some useful ideas for you guys. And we are delighted to have you and just moving forward. Oh, um, Maha Alfria, uh, who lives in Saudi Arabia, is also hoping to pop in eventually. So Dave's going to keep an eye out for her. Um, and Maha has worked online for a long time as well. Um, she's in a college of education. Her work is in online design and specifically for this week's topic, um, designing with care towards a care-centered model for online learning. Um, so that's where we're at. These are the great folks joining us and we'd love to hear your questions. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing. I think Dave's gonna give us a starter question and then we'll turn things over to everybody who's here and see what we wanna talk about this week. 
just to get things started off and sort of set some, I don't know, some ideas underway about what it means to have what, what I would call a pedagogy of care. I mean, people have different ways of talking about it, but infusing our work with care. Why don't we start with you, Laura? What does that mean to you in the work that you do? I think probably the, the most important thing for me all along has been that students have their own spaces uh, that they control and that they can feel confident in places where they can just share whatever they need to share. You know, so students in my classes, they all have blogs. They choose their own platform. It's not important what platform. And so they do their work there, but they can also just express themselves in all kinds of ways. And that's always been true. But during the pandemic, oh my gosh, there were some serious venting and grieving and just sharing what had happened because most of my students were graduating college seniors and missed out on all kinds of things, their graduation and internships and stress and worry and missing their friends and family. So the blogs were a space where they could um, share that and then also see where other people they knew from class were sharing too, you know, and not feel alone in the problems that they were facing. So I was glad I had that in place because, you know, life is hard, but life is really hard now. And so having the the spaces that are theirs, where they put there what they want, it was a big help. How about you, Michael? Um, well, I, I don't want to get all academic on folks, but I, I think actually it's useful to, to put forth a couple of theories that frame this a bit. Um, when I think about, you know, the relationships and the care, you know, the a pedagogy of care, it, to me, it's, a, it's about, um, I, it always harkens me back to Michael Moore's theory of transactional distance, which for folks who aren't familiar with it, it's basically a, a sense of psychological distance or felt distance. You know, how distant do I feel between, you know, myself and the others in the class? And uh, I'm sure we've all had the experience of sitting in that first year freshman university class, you know, lecture hall of a couple of hundred people. And even though it's not a distance education environment, you can feel quite psychologically distant between yourself and the instructor and the other students that are in the room. And, um, you know, so when I think of, of, of the pedagogy of care, for me, it's really about how do we go about decreasing that sense of psychological distance? You know, how do we make the person on the other end of the, the interaction that we're having feel like, you know, that somebody's out there that gives a damn about them, basically, um, you know, to, to put it very bluntly. And, um, you know, one of the things, you know, I see one of the comments, and I'm sure we'll get to this question in a minute or two, um, about one of the things that made it a little bit easier this time was the fact that folks already knew their students. And one of the criticisms I often see of online learning is that um, it's more difficult to create those relationships if it's entirely in the online environment. And I think that one of the things that I would always challenge teachers when I hear that is, you know, we have a lot of extended family members that we don't see very often. I mean, I've got cousins that I see in person maybe once every four or five years. You know, but how do you, you know, what is it, what are the characteristics that would allow you to maintain that close relationship with those individuals and how can we go about doing that kind of thing for mm -hmm. our students to create those connections, to create that caring relationship that is so crucial to the, the, the educational experience because, you know, there's a lot of students that will overcome inherent academic difficulties simply because of, of sheer force of will because they believe somebody cares about them on the other side of that, that experience. Yeah, I know we've seen that uh, time and time again here with the course that we're teaching with the faculty and trying to get them prepared for teaching online is that the most important part of the work that we're doing, and it becomes clear by about the second or third or fourth day, is that it's clear to them that we care about what they're doing and we understand that their struggles are, are real and we express that care as part of the work that we're doing. And by the second, third, fourth day, they start going, wow, it's a really big part of the whole teaching process, isn't it? Like we start getting that, that conversation going, right? And it's the, the hope for us is that that's going to transition for them when they, for the first time, and we always try to say like, how do you, how do you make a smile online? Like, how do you, how do you smile online? Like, what does that look like? And so those are the pieces that we're trying to do 
uh, in our work here is trying to take those really simple concepts of care and talk about it, make them visible in the way in which we do the social grooming that we do, um, you know, face to face, those other kinds of things, make them visible in a face to face way and then get people thinking about what that means to do uh, from a, when we actually try to do that online. What about you, Bon? One of the things that, that I like when I'm thinking about care generally expressed in online spaces is um, one, what about um, focusing on sort of the idea of social learning, right? So there is always an element of the social to our learning experiences. And like you've said, we need to think through the basic things that we would do. We would normally smile at people, et cetera. So how do we do that in online spaces? Um, some of the work, I think it's Sue Beckingham and Chrissy uh, Naranzi have done work on like a social learning, project-based learning framework. Um, I'm just gonna put that link into the chat here. Um, but anything that's related to expressing care for your students means that as an educator, you have to be stepping back a little bit from the idea that your core responsibility is to get people through a certain kind of work. And so as long as your relationship is to, here is the curriculum and my job is to get them from A to B or J or whatever, um, you're probably focusing on the thing you're teaching and not on the people you're teaching. And therefore it's harder to build that relationship. So that initial shift to, my job is not actually curriculum coverage, but rather teaching the students that I happen to have in front of me, whatever that means, and finding ways to work with them is probably a core, a core piece for me. Let's, let's keep rolling with that, actually, because that's a really nice bridge into the next question. It's sort of being talked about in between the comments in the chat room here, and that's how do we create that space? What are the things that we do in our own practices to create that space to allow people to do that? So when um, you know, people are talking about how everybody comes to the classroom and they're a stranger. Well, if all they're doing is sitting down and listening to us talk, they're going to remain strangers, um, right? Mm -hmm. there's, if there's no space, then, then they're not gonna be able to get to know each other well enough to create those trust pieces that are gonna allow them to start creating knowledge together. But when they start doing that, they're gonna start getting to know each other and start making those relationships that mm -hmm. allow them to feel centered, allow them to feel connected, remove that transactional mm -hmm. distance. So uh, Michael, maybe you start this time, what kind of, ways do you sort of talk about or how do you think about trying to create that space to allow people to get to know each other online well if you think of the way i sort of described it at the beginning you know that idea of making sure someone on the other end gives a damn about you um you know that kind of of situation you know, when you, if you were to turn that into academic language, it actually aligns very nicely to the, the, the concept of social presence theory, right? And social presence has two variables, you know, one is intimacy and one is immediacy, you know? So when I look at some of the ways in which we do it, I always come back to that, you know, how quickly is my response time to students and is it appropriate to the specific medium? You know, when someone texts you, there's nothing more annoying than, you know, when you see those three little dots, if you're an iPhone person, you see with those three little dots coming up or in Facebook Messenger, you know, you get that doo -doo 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 -doo, and you see they're typing something, but then you don't get any response. And a little bit for long, well, you know, you know, so and, and with iMessenger, it's really annoying because like I could text Dave and Dave may be responding to Bonnie, but because he's typing on the thing, it actually shows up on my screen that he's typing. So I know he's on his phone right then and there, but he's not responding to me. I, you know, I'm not getting that sense of immediacy in terms of the response from him. Um, whereas, you know, like if I were to email him, I'm not expecting that immediate response. So, you know, working with the selection of the specific medium that you're having different types of interactions for and how quickly or um, not so much do you need to respond based upon that particular medium is one of the things that I always sort of factor into that. Um, you know, the, the other variable with, with social presence theory is this idea of intimacy, which really is, is how do you express, you know, understanding and empathy you know, when you can't sort of, you know, look somebody in the eye and, you know, hold their hand and, and, you know, have that sort of physical, you know, reaction with them so that they can see you slump, 
you know, they can see you, you know, exhale in frustration, those types of things, you know, and mm -hmm. again, I think part of that is, you know, as depending upon what you're trying to accomplish, selecting an appropriate medium for that particular thing, um, you know, and also not just the medium, but how you set it up. You know, it's very different to for us to come into an environment like this. There's only 20 of us in here. So we would actually be a relatively small K-12 class, to be honest with you, in many contexts. You know, as folks are coming in the door, or not necessarily door, as folks are joining the webinar, um, you know, one of the things we could do is, is, you know, oh, hello, Matt. You know, I see, you know, Melanie has just joined us, you know, and, and mentioning people by name in much the same way that, you know, as folks are walking through the door of your classroom, you know, that you're, you're, you're interacting with them in the same way. You know, if I happen to know that, that Dave is a Canucks fan and I have no idea if he's not or not, um, you know, but if they lost last night, particularly if they lost to the Habs, which, you know, they would because, the Habs are just, you know, the greatest team ever to be assembled. Um, you know, I could razz him about that as he's walking in the door kind of thing. You know, like those types of things that, you know, show that you care. Um, I had a, a teacher down here in one of our local districts that um, basically would create this little 20, 30 second video that he, for each of his students, that uh, he had that he would email them and he had three actually that didn't have internet access because he's at one of the, the rural areas uh, close to the university and for those three he actually had it set up where he um on thursday of each week because he had the first week on thursday of each week he realized that you know if he sent something on thursday it would show up to the student on monday so he just sent this little handwritten card you know, basically it was a piece of construction paper that he folded in half, wrote a little, you know, funny saying on the front, and then just wrote, you know, 15 or 20 words on the inside, just, you know, the type of thing you'd say in a 20 second video. And for those three students, he sent that to them in this environment, you know, because trying to, again, sense that, you know, someone cares about you on the other end. So those are just some thoughts off the top of my head, and I probably rambled longer than I should have. You're in good company there, I tell you that. Well, me personally, not these other two fine people. Uh, Laura, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about setting that up inside of a blogging environment. I mean, you have done so many incredible sort of things with blogging specifically. And I mean, a lot of that's obviously asynchronous connection, right? A lot of that's, a lot of that's not, oh, I have this opportunity of having these people synchronously. People in the chat room are talking about the challenges of synchronous work and equity, and that's certainly an issue. But can you talk to us about that asynchronous sort of thing around blogging and how that creates that kind of connection? Oh, no, you can't talk to us. You can't talk to us. Now you can Ooh. talk to us. Thank you. Okay. Oh, good. You didn't hear my phone ringing before, so that's good. Um, it was interesting listening to Michael because I do everything asynchronously and always have. And that was partly because when I got started, which is in 2002, we didn't have these video things and audio things, you know, it just wasn't something you thought about doing teaching online. But I'm also really comfortable with it now. And, um, you know, in terms of equity and care, I think I can do a better job of making sure I attend to everyone because it's asynchronous and I'm interacting with them one-on-one -on -one consistently every week. And it doesn't take a lot. Uh, in terms of communication from the teacher or other students, you know, that, that you can feel very supported, I think, in an asynchronous environment if you're getting that kind of one-on-one -on -one feedback several times a week from people in your class. Um, like what Michael was saying about greeting people as they come in, you know, I get to know every student. And so when I'm sending them emails, I, I'm connected with them. I've learned something about them. And then I also like to connect the other students. So for example, if someone just wrote a story has a vampire in it or something, I'll say, hey, you know, Dave wrote a vampire story like two weeks ago. Here's a link to it. You know, go look to it. I love the way that asynchronous stuff spreads out in time, right? So it's not just that it's not at the same time, but it's the whole time, right? And one of my jobs, I think, as a teacher is to be like the institutional memory for the course so that I know all the stories that all the students have written and I can be making those connections all semester long saying, oh, you know, you've got this great metafiction thing going on here. You know who's really into metafiction is this guy who's not even in our class, but he's in the other class and you can go see his blog and dialogue with him about metafiction there at his blog. So for me, I'm really comfortable with that 
asynchronous approach, but it's based on the exact same kinds of ideas that, that Michael was talking about, making those connections, being aware of students. And I also want to put in a pitch here for self-care, right? That, you know, students aren't always going to have a, a teacher who's right there or a friend who's right there to help them in the moment. But there are all kinds of things you can do to help students learn how to help themselves in the moment. And I have a lot of that meta kind of writing stuff, writing therapy stuff uh, in my classes. I started doing micro fictions with the students and micro biography fiction this semester and they just loved it, you know, so that that writing about their first pet or remembering their first day of school or, you know, remembering their grandparents. They did all kinds of just extra writing in the class. It was just extra credit. It wasn't required content, but they really enjoyed writing as a way to just sort of connect with themselves and ground themselves and, and show care and honor their own lives. And that was a great thing, especially, like I said, this semester with the pandemic. I wonder, Bonnie, if you couldn't follow up with that. There's a lot of conversation in the chat room around the, the missing folks. Um, so as long as you've got your hands on people and you're able to communicate with them and they're responding and you know they're on the other end of the email or um, you know, they're showing up to your synchronous classes, then it's, it's one thing. But what kinds of things do you do with the people that are, for whatever reason, don't seem to be there? How do you care for them? I think that actually, like any time that you're teaching, all you can do is try to communicate. There have been students that I've had in fully face-to-face -face classes, students that I've had in fully online classes, that I know in the time that we were in a student-teacher relationship, we have failed to connect. Most of them made it through my class and managed to pass, um, but the actual real kind of relationship may not necessarily have, have taken off. And a lot of the things that I was trying to communicate to them, um, I'm sure they were a tiny minority or not. Um, but, um, you know, you're not going to reach everybody. You're not going to be all things to all people. That's important to remember. Um, and I think it's important to remember that you haven't always fully connected with every learner that you've had in your class. Right now, people have more agency in an online environment, people have more agency in a, what is mostly at least right now at sort of the end of the emergency remote teaching tale, particularly for K-12, students and families have more agency to say, no, thank you right now, right? I'm seeing in my own Facebook feed, a lot of parents, often professional parents, um, who are just like, this is too much for me right now. And there is refusal. And I think that refusal is a legit way for people to make decisions, whether they are you know, adult learners uh, in, in university who are making agential decisions for themselves or families who are making agential decisions for their families. Um, so it isn't always visible to us why people are not engaged, um, but sometimes it's because we are not offering something that they know how to receive or know how to make sense of. One of the nice things about a pedagogy of care, um, John pointed out one of the challenges of face-to-face -face is that it keeps everybody in lockstep, right? Some students take 20 minutes to do something, some take 40, others are waiting, some feel left behind. If we're working primarily in asynchronous environments, we do actually have the capacity to give students a little more of the take your own path towards learning. Um, that can be challenging to support, uh, but for instance, years ago, I think it may have even been Christine is here, and Christine was in a class um, of adult learners uh, at the college taking adult learning, uh, folks who had been hired as experts in their field to uh, begin teaching. And one of the classmates who may have been in, in Christine's section was a gentleman who was an amazing welder uh, who was you know, probably um, about 60 at the time and really wasn't even comfortable on email. And suddenly he's in an entirely online class environment. And so it took me actually finding out his phone number and I hate the phone. Like I only call my mother. I otherwise don't use the telephone, but I, he needed me to reach out by phone and make sure that I had a, Dave actually currently has my phone because, and it's usually otherwise dead. Um, I don't use it as a telephone, but that student needed me to use it as a telephone and talk him through getting logged in, understanding the distinction between the email and the LMS, 
that was just part of my, now I was super lucky. I was teaching one class at a time. I was not teaching five. I didn't have 200 students, et cetera, but I had to kind of figure out what was going on there and then um, find ways to support that student. When we're in asynchronous, using asynchronous communications, there is room for the introverts to maybe find a voice that they might not actually be speaking up in class. There are ways to scaffold different people using their strengths and their learning in different ways. I don't think that we are ever going to make this work wonderfully for everybody. I think it is super important if we can to try to reach out and see who those students might be who are taking an agential, no thank you, I'm good on my own right now, and those students who may be literally falling through cracks. And people don't always even know which one they are, um, but doing some kind of reach out is, is probably key. Yeah, I wanna echo what Matt's saying in chat room there too, which is even if they don't, you never hear back from them. It doesn't mean they're not listening, right? right? Th that care need not, need not be reciprocated, right? Uh, and, and I say it need not, and that's where I'd like to turn this conversation a bit because uh, one of the things that I discovered in the middle of last week moving into last weekend is that taking on a new group of 20 and 25 faculty every week was starting to burn me out. Not, not, not tired wise, just emotionally because at the start of the week, you're doing the heavy lifting and you're trying to support people. And the start of every week we get a new group and they're upset and they're frustrated and they're trying to get better and they're working really hard and they need a lot of emotional support on the front end. Uh, not everybody, not all the time, but a lot of them do. And there's a lot of energy that's required in the beginning of that. So one of the things that I, I we asked, we, we worked it so that this week we didn't teach. I'm still working, but I needed a week of not doing that lifting uh, just to sort of get myself back centered again. So in terms of that care, to me, it goes both ways. So while extending all that care to students, what do you do to keep your own self centered so that you can, because I don't want somebody to go out and make a comment in every single blog post or every single discussion forum post or every single thing any student ever said, because if you try to do that and you have four courses, you are not going to make it, right? Eventually you're going to start to wear yourself out. So what kind of strategies do you have to express that care, but maybe in a way that allows you to be, let's use the word more efficient, um, maybe more strategic? Uh, I don't know what word you would use, but what kinds of things do you do to make sure you can express that care, but maybe without burning yourself out? Laura, you get your head nodding, so why don't you go first? Well, I'll, I'll make a pitch for one of my favorite forces in the world, which is random. You know, I make these randomizers that I use to distribute all kinds of things throughout the class. So like how the students comment on each other, that's at random. And I also use randomizers to guide some of my own interactions. So every day I interact with a few students in the class at random. You know, it's not because I picked them out. It's not because I'm expending any effort of any kind figuring out, well, who am I going to talk to today? It's just like, poof. Let the randomizer tell me where to go. And there's always something in their blog for me to comment on. It's easy. And then over time, I just trust that, you know, mathematics, random, it'll work. I'll get around to everybody. Uh, so I'm a big believer in randomizers. You can make them in spreadsheets. I have a little tool I use to make randomizers. But especially if you're dealing with a lot of stuff, a lot of people, a lot of content, a lot of work, whatever, randomization can be your friend. So, that's a really cool not idea. quite efficiency, but no, 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 but, but it is. That's a really nice yeah. way of thinking about it because then you still mm -hmm. feel like you're doing your job, you still mm -hmm. feel like you're organized and structured, but you're not scripted doing all the work all the time, which I think yep. is something that you're not at least I am not able to keep that up. I need to pace myself or I will burn out, right? I know that I won't be able to stay at that level if I don't have some kind of process. How about you, Michael? How do you become more efficient with your pedagogies of care? Well, one trick that, and I've, it's been so long ago now, I have no idea where, who, who mentioned it to me. And I actually don't even think it was dealing with online learning. I think it was actually uh, when I first started teaching in higher ed as a, a, a TA you know, during my doc program. But at some point, someone told me that I needed to essentially create a word file where I put all of my student comments and student emails into that word file and then save it by, um, by class. And, you know, I mean, I, 
I know it might not sound like you are being all that empathetic if if you were to email me something, Dave, and I sent you the same response that I sent Bonnie three months ago. But in all honesty, if the types of things that you're struggling with or the things that I need, that I think you need to hear from me are the same things that I think she needed to hear from me, there's no reason why I need to spend another 20 minutes typing out the exact same response when I can go to my Word document and copy and paste it and stick it in there that quickly. And, and I, again, I've been, I've been doing it for so long, I don't know who told me to do that, but it is a, something that I've literally been doing for well over a decade now. And I've always amazed at how much I can you know, reuse those things. And it's not that I'm not being authentic. I mean, we all know that in, in our verbal conversations, I mean, how many times have you given the same piece of advice to multiple people, you know, verbally? I mean, this is basically just, you know, saving yourself from, it's kind of like, you know, having a little tape recorder and just being able to play it back to the person, you know, to the next person kind of thing. But that's one of the things I've done to, to make my life a little bit easier while still trying to engage in, in this pedagogy of care. And I found that over the years, as I've reused those answers, I've been able to add to them and refine them and I think make them a little more, you know, poignant, make them a little bit more effective. And I haven't had to spend as much time doing that because, you know, it's, I can spend five minutes editing something that I've already written instead of spending 15 minutes typing it out in the original and make it a much better product in the end. You should start doing that for the kids in the house, Bon. Sold. Right? <laughs> Please see section F R <laughs> three. <laughs> yeah, randomization you, doesn't work very well for two people. I hate to yeah. break it to you. Fine. Fine. Um, How about you? What are your for strategies? For me, the, the biggest thing is uh, taking a lot of it off of me. And particularly once I went from teaching one course at a time to teaching you know, four or five large courses at a time because the, the number is just too much. And online teaching, in my experience, does take more time. And certainly doing it with care, it takes more time because I may have those answers, but I've got people coming in on three channels and I still, there's a lot just to organize, particularly online that I don't have to do. There's a whole level of cognitive load that I don't have when I'm in a classroom. Um, and there's less downtime. So what I do is I use the structure of the internet and I make everything participatory, meaning that it isn't my job to respond to everything. It becomes Laura's job and Michael's job and Dave's job and Sybil's job and Sherry's job and Philip's job and Autumn's job to respond to each other, just like you all are doing in the chat room. Um, some of that is informal and chat rooms can be a great space for that. If it doesn't emerge organically, in a lot of classes it won't because students have been conditioned to sit down and wait to be filled with the knowledge. I have to actively, one, break that idea that they're waiting to be filled with the knowledge. Two, I need to create really good spaces where they are taking a piece of the knowledge and, um, sorry, I messed my headphone up, um, taking a piece of the knowledge, but finding a way to connect it to something that is theirs that they can't be wrong on, right? Something that is kind of, um, some kind of higher order thinking or connection to their own life and then sharing that and asking them to do feedback for each other. They know, and I tell them honestly, I will not see everything you post, right? At the end of the term or at the end of the year, I go back and I'm looking through all of these discussion forums and realizing I missed a lot of good stuff, but the students all get responded to. And I make it clear that it is our group responsibility to ensure that my students are all future teachers, right? So it's, that we don't want to leave somebody behind is, is something that is easy to sell um, to them. But for the most part, pe people will go along with that. I want to follow that up actually, because it bridges into the next, com next question I wanted to ask or like topic to put on the table, which is, so I understand the care for the students. I understand for the care for yourself, but what things do you put in place to help students care for each other? So getting them to do that work with each other is one thing. Another one's about setting the standards for how that gets done creating that social contract, establishing that norm of interactivity, which has them do more than great job in the comments, but rather do something that actually gives them uh, a chance to, um, to speak personally and you know, let's say creatively to each other in a way that seems supportive. How about you, Michael? You've got some head nods going on down there. 
how do you establish that social contract to make sure the students are expressing that care for each other? Um, in all honesty, that's the one I, I, I continue to struggle with year to year. Um, you know, because it, it is challenging when you have a bunch of people from differing backgrounds and um, in some cases, you know, varying interests. Uh, I think to the, the blogging course I teach every summer, um, you know, and everyone's blogging about whatever they want to blog about. So I've got everything from, you know, these guys who are doing, you know, high tech, you know, building of computer network stuff to someone who's, you know, just blogging about, uh, you know, a less Last year, I remember I had one who was doing interior design because she staged, her second job was in addition to being a teacher, she staged homes for, you know, people who wanted to sell them. So her blog was all about this staging stuff and, you know, trying to get people to actually care about that and to, to do those types of things. Um, I mean, modeling and modeling in a very public way, I think is one of the things I always try to do. <clears throat> Um, the other thing that I do is uh, I try to set things up in such a way where there's a rubric of expectations, but it's not a quantitative type rubric. So it's not like you must comment on X number of people and respond to, you know, those, you know, five people who respond to you kind of thing. Uh, it describes behaviors that I want to see. You know, are you actively engaged? You know, do you post frequently? Do you interact with, you know, in, describing those types of things because the one thing that I often find particularly with asynchronous interactions is what I'll call the the drive-by interaction you know um, and I see it in my blogging class all the time you know I, I log in on Tuesday and I post my blog entry and if two people already have theirs up I might you know leave a comment on that and then I don't do anything until Thursday or Friday, and then I'll log in, spend an hour going through and looking at two or three other folks. And if anyone responded to something I posted on Tuesday, I might interact with them. And then I'll log in again and I'll disengage until Sunday. You know, and, and you know, sort of that drive-by approach model that I have. So, you know, trying to create an environment where, um, Essentially, those things, are, and this is more in the higher ed realm than in the K-12 realm, but, you know, that because students are still, for whatever reason, motivated by grades. Um, even though, you know, my doc students are never going to get asked for a transcript ever again, they still all want A's for some reason. Um, you know, so creating a, a, an evaluation regime that, that encourages those kinds of behaviors. Laura, how about you? Uh, like Michael said, I've worked on this a lot, too, because it's it's not easy, but it's really important. I shared in the chat a link to some materials that I pulled together about feedback stuff and I actually spend the first five weeks of the semester working on feedback related stuff. So students are doing comments on each other's blogs, just kind of social fun comments, but sort of substantive feedback stuff. We spend several weeks working on just, you know, all the feelings associated with both giving feedback and receiving feedback, uh, lots of different strategies, because by and large, students have not been taught any strategies, like maybe they know the, the sandwich one, you know, that they'll say, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Say something good, say something bad, say something good as a sandwich. Um, so I've got lots of materials about that. And what's cool is that my students anyway are really excited to work on that stuff because they realize feedback is not just a school thing. It happens in their workplaces. It happens in their groups that they are in, sports, music, whatever. And so I found that they're really eager to talk about feedback and explore their experiences and share their experiences and ideas. And we spend substantial time on it because it's important. And one thing I want to make a pitch for, too, is uh, at least in the world of blogging, Michael was talking about that. Students write introduction posts at their blogs, and um, I weave those into the assignments all semester long. So when you're reading someone's blog and leaving a comment, you also read their introduction post if you haven't read it before and learn about who they are as a person. And so that's constantly bringing into play the things that people wanted to share in their introduction, whatever that is. Some people share a lot about themselves. Some people don't share much, but it's, it's what they wanted to share. And so finding ways to take that introduction piece, whatever it is, in your discussion board or in a blog or, or wherever students are doing that intro thing that they do, if you can find ways to reuse that and weave it into later assignments, that's great. That helps the students connect and understand what 
the other students care about, right? Because part of caring is, is seeing what other people care about. People care about different things and um, helping students see what other students care about and then you learn what they care about. It, it makes a big difference. So Bonnie, I think I was introduced to the term social contract in your master's thesis in 1998 or 99. So uh, why don't you go next? Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is hard. And they're, the biggest thing about any teaching and learning context is, um, and I'll watch my, my language a little bit, uh, the nice version of it that both Dave and I have used is the give a hoot factor, which normally that is not necessarily the four letter word we would, would put in there, but um, trying to find ways to get people to care about what's on the table as more than a grade, um, while respecting that many of us have that inner Lisa Simpson that also wants to be graded, um, that, that give a hoot factor and that social contract is to me partly talking about what are we here to do? Um, what are the key, breaking down the, the key ideas that you're hoping people would work with, breaking down, those down into, these are different ways that I'd be happy to engage with or receive some of this from you, giving a little bit of room and creating a little bit of room where people can work with the messiness of those ideas. Often that isn't something that students uh, are acculturated to feel comfortable with. And so it may take a while or more time than you have to even get there. But when you do, and if you do, then there is kind of, there, there's value in that. I think even putting out for students the idea that we are in a learning experience together and that the biggest piece for me is that I'm not going to abuse my power. That is the biggest part of the teaching social contract that I can make clear from the beginning and then I have to adhere to and sometimes I make a mistake and then I actually have to be like you know what all right I said this and I thought that was only a 5.5 .5 out of 8 but blah 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 or or whatever um, particularly as we move online the biggest thing that I think we need to shift out of is the zero-sum relationship to teaching I think that it's true lots of there are lots of students who may not be in our learning experiences for the reasons we would like them to be. We need to respect the places that they're coming from and examine the ways in which we engage in the powerful role of being a teacher so that they can potentially begin to trust us and move towards the powerful role of being a student. We may not see them get there. They may not get there. They may and we don't see it. Those that we can see, it's really amazing. Um, to me, it's all we can put, put that I, out. I just want to add one comment, and this is just, I don't know if this is just me, but one of the things that I found is there's two, at least two cycles of social contract you need to establish. There's the one at the beginning when you're trying to set everything up, and then there's the one once everybody starts to get comfortable. And it's almost like you have to go back and do it again because mm -hmm. people start to overlearn some of the lessons. And you have certainly seen this in MOOCs, like for sure, for sure. But even in my sort of more formal classrooms, it seems like it's the sort of thing you've got to remember about halfway through to go back and kind of do again and mm -hmm. set that standard again. Because they, they didn't, it's hard to tell somebody about something they don't understand at the beginning. And so you tell them and they kind of half understand and then they follow those beliefs through. And it's almost like you've got to stop halfway and go, okay, so let's go back to that thing we were talking about at the beginning. Now that all y'all have been doing this for five or six weeks, let's reestablish that consistent pattern again. So I, I don't know if that's just me that's had that expression, but I just thought I would drop that in. It is four o'clock. I don't even know if we have time for last words. Bonnie, what do you think? I think that I want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's, I mean, all of this, I just really appreciate everybody who is here and, and, and putting things into the chat because particularly this past week, right, we have found out here in Windsor at least that we're going to be online for the fall and in my classes, their full year, so probably for the whole year. Um, just found out this afternoon that my kids are going to be online till fall. Now that we're starting to have a sense of how things are shaping up and what the reality is going to be, um, it's really important for me to think these through, right? I'm doing a digital pedagogy lab um, course this summer, I think, and it's going to be largely asynchronous one week. I have to rethink a lot of um, the things that I 
you know, know how to do in terms of how do I do a short intensive non-synchronous course. So these, these conversations and all those tools were really, really appreciated. Um, oh, awesome. Yay, Amanda. I'm so glad. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. And uh, specific thanks to Michael and Laura. I'm so sad that Mahal Freya couldn't join us, but they are having a major meeting um, it's Ramadan, and so meetings are, are late at night there right now, and um, she just wasn't able to join us, but hopefully she'll be able to pop in for another week. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody.